If you have your Bibles uh, and you'd like to follow along, I'll be reading in uh, 1 Peter uh, in chapter 2, and I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. And he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word, and they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you are not like that. For you are a chosen people. You are a royal priest, a holy nation, God's own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires and the wage war against your very soul. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behaviors and they will give you honor to God when he judges the world. May God honor his perfect and holy word. What is our mission? What is our purpose? What is our goal? What is the thing that we're supposed to do and why do we do it? The Bible is the key to understanding those questions. If we stumble in this life and we don't know God, we don't really know what to do. And so many people don't know what to do because we live in a world that is, as the Bible says in John 3, condemned already. We're moving towards an inevitable end death. We will all die, and that's a bit of a morbid thought as our entire creation moves towards death. But God did something to prevent that. God acted. He offered to us hope, and the words that Peter expressed to us is this, that death need not be our fate. Eternal separation from God need not be the fate of all human beings, but instead that they may know Jesus and have the hope to be with him. That God has chosen you and gifted you out of that. That he has brought you from darkness into his beautiful light. This light that brings illumination into the world. Peter reminds us that this world itself is very temporary. It's not our home. We're foreigners, visitors, people who are coming only for a short trip. But then one day we'll be called out of this world into the place we were always intended to be, where we will be forever. But while we are yet alive, God has sent us here on this mission. He has given us instructions, things we are to do, carrying out His will, to obey His word, to teach others to do the same, to know Him more intimately. This goes back very far in the Bible. We can go back to the book of Genesis in chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to the land I show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. God calling Abram to himself, telling him to leave everything he ever knew, every place he ever knew and to come and follow him. And if he did that, God would bless him. And we read that and we probably think, well, good, good job, Abraham or Abram at this time, you did it, you followed. Do we realize that God is often calling us to leave things that we know? And how hard that is, it is hard, to leave the things that are valued and loved to those things that we've known, to do something, as we said in our prayer time, something new that we've never done before. But the most important thing is to do what God asks us to do, to seek Him in everything as individuals and as a congregation. And when we don't know what God wants us to do, seek Him more until we're able to know what He wants us to do. 
You see, a lot of times we'll read a passage like this, and I think our tendency at times is to focus on the special privilege that God gave him, right? It says, you know, I will bless you. Oh, good. I want to be blessed. Oh, and I will curse those who don't do nice things. Oh, that's good, too. I, I don't mind that. And while we certainly rejoice that we are with God's side and that we take solace in the hard times when people are upset and angry and treat us bad because of Christ, we also must remember who our true enemy is. It is the adversary, right? Is it not Satan who leads us astray? Our battle isn't against flesh and blood. It's against the evil one whose lies mislead this world and trick many people into many false beliefs and behaviors. We all know what it's like to get beat down, don't we? I can't imagine there's a person in this room that has followed Christ for very long that hasn't got beat down by other people just for loving God. I get it. It hurts. But in those times, just remember who the true enemy is. It is the one who has lied and tricked others into these false ideas. It's like our passage says here at the end, um, in you, the families of the earth shall be blessed. Some translations say, through you. If we obey God, if we're seeking Him, if we're doing what He wants in this world, then others will be blessed. How will they be blessed? They will be blessed because they see God in you, that they too might know this God who offered to them, as someone said during our um, praise time, the resurrection to new life. So, Let's be encouraged. You can do it. You can follow and obey God. You can live your life on a mission for God. He will give you that understanding. He will lead you and guide you. And we all know that the sad reality is that this world is not always a great place to be in, particularly when you're following God. There seems to be fewer and fewer people at times who are truly having hearts to follow. And we can easily get into that old mindset of thinking, well, I'm just glad God saved me. And so now I'm going to play the waiting game and I'm going to sit here till I die. And then I get to go to heaven and whatever happens, happens. That's a bad way to look at life. The world is getting worse, but our response isn't to just hold on and wait. Instead, it's to do and to go and to share because God is asking more of us than just holding on. He wants us to go. I think of people like Mike Kaufman and others who have been firefighters. Well, others run away from fire. Firefighters run into fire. Why? To save others, that they may too have an opportunity at life. In some sense, that is the call of all Christians, to run towards the, the horrible the bad, the less than ideal situations that others might have life. Too many of us, I think, just think that Jesus died on the cross for my future reality that when I die, I will go to heaven. And yes, celebrate that. That is beyond wonderful. And it is a fundamental, beautiful truth. But can we not rejoice every day that God has given to us this life? that he has given to us our time here as a mission to carry out his will and to teach others to do the same. Our passage sometimes or in the Bible talks about the kingdom of God. Let me ask the question, where is the kingdom of God? When does it happen? I think for a lot of people, they just think that God's kingdom is only in heaven. And of course, the Bible uses that to refer to heaven, yes, but may I suggest that the kingdom of God isn't just in the future, but it is a present reality. That the moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, when you say, I want to live my life where He is the Lord, then He has come into your life. He has given you a mission. You are one day going to stand with Him, but while you are here on this earth, He has given to you this time to be used, to know Him, and to serve Him. And yes, we have a future reality to know the wonder of heaven to be in communion with God. But while you are here on this earth, He has something for you to do. I know that when I was younger, I wrongly just assumed that, you know, a lot of this life was just waiting to get to heaven. But what did Jesus say? 
Matthew 4, 17. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Luke 10, 9. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. Luke 17, 21. You won't be able to say, here it is, or it's over there, for the kingdom of God is already among you. It is here to know His will, to carry out His will. Our focus, of course, is to get to heaven and to bring other people there. But in order to do that, He has given us this life that we may share Jesus of what He has done in this world with the people who are around us. Our passage was Peter writing to the early church. And he says there again in verse 9, you know, you're not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's own possession. As a result, you may show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. What's a priest? A priest is someone who goes to God on the behalf of someone else. If we are called priests, who are we going to God on behalf of whom? Those who need to know Him. We need to be going to God, praying that God will help us share our faith, praying for people we know that need faith in God, that they will come and find Him. And as Christians, in our denomination, we believe in the priesthood of all believers, that everyone has that ability and capacity because He loves you, and He called you, and He trains you. You have been chosen for a purpose. We're not chosen just to sit on our hands like we're waiting for a bus. When's Jesus gonna get here? He's running late again. No. He wants us to be doing stuff for Him, to bless others, and how are others ultimately blessed? that they would see God in us, that God would be allowed to use us for His ends. Think about it. Don't you talk about the people you love? It'd be hard to be around someone very long without bringing up your husband, your wife, your children, grandchildren, people you love, right? Here's a picture, here's a photo, here's a little story about them. Well, if you know God and you love Him, it's kind of hard never to bring Him up, isn't it? He's just a naturally a part of who you are, just like you don't hide and be like, oh, I don't want anyone to know I have a child, Ooh. right? No, you, you love the people in your family, and if you're God's family, you want to share it with people. Sharing our faith isn't just for the most gifted or the smartest people. It's for everyone and who you are. It should just be natural, as natural as you talk about your brother or your mom because you have a relationship with God and it just comes out of you. You see, God's been writing his story since the beginning of time. It's ongoing and since then he has given us all that mission to play a part in this unfolding story for us, his set apart royal priesthood. And he sets us apart, not so we're part of some elite club where we can be like flash our membership card and be like, oh, they have to let me in now, right? But because we want to bless others, that they too may come to find Jesus, to live close to Him. And so what does that mean for us as a community of faith? Well, it should mean that a church is a place that people come to know about Jesus, not just to get a, a, a spiritual fix for the week and a little boast of encouragement, although that can be needed and helpful to each of us, but we don't come to say, hey God, I gave you an hour, so later this week when I do, you know, that, you know, he cut me a little slack, right? That's not the way it works. It's not just the place where we just think like, I'm going to sit back and eat at God's buffet and get some more learning in me. No, it's to learn to share that with other people. That's why we have wisdom and knowledge. This church isn't a place where we just hire professional people to do stuff for us. Instead, we're equipped to do it for ourselves. A church is a place 
that isn't contemporary or cool or hip or young or even old or traditional or liturgical. Those things are always secondary because style doesn't matter as much as substance. A willingness to seek and to know God, however that's expressed in terms of stylistic, okay. But to seek God at the heart of the matter because a true church is a faith that assumes that God is on the throne. God doesn't exist just to improve the life, my life in the way I want. Like now I have better, I came, became a Christian, now I have better relationships and I have more money and they increase my visa card limit and you know, um, all these things. Some of God blesses us, of course he does and we praise him for that, but that's not our motivation to get more in this life, but to store for ourselves treasures <coughs> with God, not by what the world values, by what God values. So what, what steps can we take? Well, hopefully we become increasingly more a community of, of people that help each other discover what is it that Jesus wants us to do? What is our identity in him? Don't we see ourselves first and foremost as followers of Jesus? If someone asks you right now, who are you? Who are you? Hopefully, one of the first, if not the first thing, is that I follow Jesus. I'm a Christian. I know God. I, and if it isn't those things, what's more important to you? And why are those things more important to you? That we should be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to guide us into deepening relationships with Him. That we should be in the world, but not of the world. Meaning we engage, we understand the world that we live in, the culture around us, the expectations and needs of people. But we don't conform ourselves to the expectations of the world. Instead, we allow the gospel to transform culture, not the other way around. That we are faithful in proclaiming his message in word and deed. And that God comes first in the decisions that we make. When we, when we sit down as individuals and as a group to think, what does God want us to do? Our primary concern should be about what does God want? And we're going to seek that and try our best to fulfill that. Sometimes even placing the needs of other people over our own so that God is glorified. To show love to our neighbor. See, we need to practice hospitality. Welcome in anyone who comes into our midst, the stranger and foreigner among us, to love them. We're not going to change God's word. <laughs> We're not going to conform what it says. But for you to be here, we welcome you. And we are glad you are here to show everyone that they are created in his image. We will welcome others as God has welcomed us. And if we see ourselves on a mission to serve God, then we understand that everything we do is a reflection on our relationship with God. Our behaviors, our thoughts, our attitudes, the words we use, the choice of time and effort, they were reflections on God because we are ambassadors. We represent God with the things we do and say. And so we certainly don't want to do anything that is embarrassing to God, do we? And so we will gather today for worship, right? Why do we gather for worship? Because it's a beautiful thing, right? It makes us feel good to worship God, to reconnect with the God who made us, to come together with like people of precious faith that we can praise God, share the things that God has done to, as a means of uplifting, praising God, but also a sense of encouragement among ourselves that we can gather together and pray for the concerns and needs that we have, that we can read God's word and gain understanding in our, our lives, that we can come together and vocalize in songs or adoration for the God who has given us so much. But it's not just an event. It shouldn't be. It should be like charging up batteries that everything that we do is spreading God's word, spreading his message. It's not just a Sunday thing. It's an everyday thing. It's a community, right? Where we want to learn to be more like who Jesus wants each one of us to individually be. That God gets to sharpen our, our skills. We learn more. He sharpens our personality to use who he gave us in our personality and how to use that to effectively communicate him to other people. And some of us are shy and we don't know how to do that. Well, God will be with you. He'll give you chances. It's not always just in great eloquent speeches but in small and little phrases and time spent with people. 
a moment of caring and concern in a time of hurt or pain. It's whatever God has given to you and your personality and your skills. It's not that you're going to come up next Sunday and deliver a sermon. Maybe he will ask you to do that. I don't know, but there's so many ways in which God is going to use you. But you have to be open to it. You have to seek God and what he wants us to do so that we're all growing because we don't stop growing in Christ. It's never anywhere in the Bible where you're going to stop and say, well, you graduated, you made it, here's your diploma. We're always learning, always growing while we're still on this earth. That the church, a true church, should be a place of healing where people come together, they're hurt. A lot of people that are going to come to church for the first time or people that aren't used to churches, there's a reason. Something bad has happened to them and they are trying to make sense of it and it doesn't make sense. And so they need love and support and love lifted and teaching and education. And we can offer that to them as they're gently restored, helping them to overcome the things that are sinful and wrong in their lives with education and understanding and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But all along behind that, the reason for that is God's love and His desire for a relationship with them. It's my hope that those are the things that we strive to do when we strive to become. To remember that God has given to each of us individually and then collectively as a church body a mission to do while we are alive. As Peter's words said, once you had no identity as a people, but now you're God's people. Once you received no mercy, but now you have received God's mercy. We didn't have an identity at one point, not a true useful identity. We might have identified with ourselves by all kinds of things, but the only identity that's really going to matter forever is our identity in Christ that God has gifted to us. Once there were times in our lives when we did not know mercy, but then God was merciful to us. And we felt his mercy, and we have an opportunity to share that mercy with those who are around us. Let us pray. God, you are so kind in gifting to us a mission that you loved us, that you called us individually and as a congregation to understand our mission and purpose, to be a part of your church and to do your will in this world. Help us to more intimately know you, Help us as individuals and as the Newberry Town Church of God to understand what it is we are to do, how we are to live, the things we are to prioritize. Help us to understand your heart. Help us to change our perspectives. Help us to understand that we are to be your servants. We are agents of change in the world around us that will make it better as we increase our love and devotion for you. And may we want to share that with all who are around us. In Jesus' name, amen.